everybody. Thank you for joining us, joining us again this week. And on the chair, I've got an amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm not sure how many amazings I'm going to use, but anyway, <laughs> you guys, you'll discover just now who I've got. <laughs> I've got a, a good friend of mine who's here to talk to us about leadership. Um, there's a lot going on in our country. There's a lot going on in our organizations. And I decided I really want to have a series that just looks at leadership. And she's the first one who's going to be talking to us about this. And yeah, let her introduce herself. People do a better job if they introduce themselves in, uh, on, on this platform. But if you're finding us for the first time, please do follow us, do everything that people do on social media. Um, like, comment, um, share. We'll love to hear what you've got to say about our change conversations. Over to you. Happy to have you. My absolute pleasure to be here. Um, this is going to be a very long introduction, so you'll be sorry you asked. Um, <laughs> so let me start by saying my name is Tembisile Kulu. I am a mother of two beautiful hip hop girls. So I'm a dance mom. So I dance so we can dance off Manje like now. I couldn't mind. <laughs> Um, I also um, am a big sister to two handsome young men, uh, as well as a young lady. I am a daughter to a retired mom who lives with me full time. Uh, and I think I'm a loving, jolly, generous, kind uh, person who inherently believes in the good in other people. Um, just out of interest, I've had the same domestic helper for the past 20 years since my first born was born. So I, I don't, I can't relate to these horror stories about new nannies every month, you know? So that to me says there must be some goodness in me as well. Um, she is humble. She's kind. She loves my kids and my kids adore her. For my sins, I also happen to be a medical doctor by training. I'm a public health uh, professional by further training. And uh, I also did a diploma in obstetrics and a diploma in HIV medicine. And it was my love for making sure that HIV is not transmitted uh, to unborn babies by pregnant mothers that then forced me to go that route. Uh, HIV is obviously a public health issue. So I studied a master's in public health and I specialized in health management and health policy. And at some point, um, you know, I felt one-on-one -on -one medicine was not for me. So working at policy level was quite interesting. And um, I then joined a board of directors at the age of 30, a board of substance. I'm two years shy of 50. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that um, I then went to the Institute of Directors uh, to equip myself with governance. So I'm a special kind of doctor who has got a governance knowledge, and I'm, I think I'm a governance guru, uh, especially governance experience in the nonprofit sector. And um, I actually was managing director for for-profit entity at some stage in my life. Uh, so, you know, revenue, profit, return on investment targets, you know, don't scare me. So yeah, my name is T, is Dr. Tembi Kulu, known as Dr. T, Dr. X, Dr. TX, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the South African National AIDS Council, and I'm also the Chairperson of the South Africa Global Fund Country Coordinating Mechanism. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. <laughs> you know, Tembi, on, on a serious note, Dr. T, what you've just done, most of us battle to do because we were brought up to not shine, to not actually own the stuff that we've really done. Mm -hmm. And what you've just done, you've actually owned, you've owned your, I can't even say the word, but you've owned it. It's yours and proudly you kind of, I'm, 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 I'm every woman. You are every woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, really hoping that anybody who's listening to us or who watches us, they take that lesson 
of having to own the things that you've done because, and mainly as black females, we battle. True. We battle to say, this is who I am. And these are my achievements because what you've just rattled now, it's like who you are and nobody absolutely. can take it away from you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I could go wow. on, but I'm, I'm just respecting you, my friend. I could go on. <laughs> I'll kick you out like, ah, ah, now it's too much. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. But thank you for taking the time. So as I said, today, we've been threatening each other for a while to have this conversation. And we want to have a conversation, a conversation around leadership. And please define leadership for us. When you, when you hear, the word gets thrown around so many times. Like what exactly does it mean? Or what does it mean for you? Because it might be different things to different people, you know? Sure. All right. Um, so for me, I would say um, leadership is, is um, I, I consider leadership to be a blessing that has been given to me that allows me to build and grow and create other leaders. This means I must be able to create an, an enabling environment for the people that I work with to be able to express their ideas uh, so that their, their ideas are not just heard, but explored, you know, to the best interest uh, of the company. Um, to me, leadership means giving people comfort in understanding what my expectations of them are. And that means I must be very clear in terms of, for instance, a, a, a job description, you know, targets, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, leadership means um, the people that I lead must know that I protect them because I expect them to make decisions within their particular portfolios because I trust them to do the jobs that they are hired to do. So when I expect them to make decisions, sometimes those decisions might be wrong but if they are made in what they thought was the best interest of the company, they need to know that they will be protected and covered by myself. So I think um, it's, it's I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a, in a CEO position now for the past 18 months at Sanak, and there are people who've been at Sanak much, much longer than I am. So what I believe I'm doing as a leader is I'm essentially driving the bus. And the bus is full of executives and senior managers who are carrying the GPS. And they are telling us where to go because they, they, they know uh, the, the terrain and where we've been. But the truth of the matter is that the map and the terrain are not always the same. Mm -hmm. And leadership means as much as I have a clear, clear vision around where I want to take us, I can't be too stuck on the certainty because the map and the terrain are always different. I'm not going to be schizophrenic and changing decisions all the time, but I need to have the, the chutzpah to make and change course where I have to change course. And when I do that, having consulted with my team, that is when I believe I have people that follow me because as a leader, I don't lead ideas, I lead people. So as a leader, I also need followers and people will follow you when they know that you believe in them, you support them um, and you, you trust them in terms of what they are hired to do. Wow. So, so for you though, where, where did you feel that the leadership thing is in you? Is it something that you think you learned or is it something that you think was innate in who you are? Goodness, when I joke about this, um, I always say uh, I was a prefect uh, even at nursery school um, <laughs> <laughs> when I joke about it. But I, I, I think um, I was fortunate in that I was, I, I was, I was given opportunities that, as I said, that helped to bring out the best in me. And that's when I realized that I had the potential to walk into a room and change the atmosphere um, and get people to follow because sometimes all I did was listen to their ideas. 
you know, and that is how you sometimes know that um, you might come into a room with an idea and um, you might be convinced that that is the best way to go uh, with the idea. But just the ability to listen and to incorporate other views and other strategies that you might not have thought about makes it so palatable to your people that you are actually able to achieve more than you are able to do. So I think working in that HIV space, I, I was initially an HIV treatment uh, expert program manager, and uh, it was around 2005 when HIV was new in this country. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I managed a group of, of, of nurses or clinical case managers, and we were actually training doctors on how to manage HIV. You can imagine I was 29 or 30 years old just before I got promoted to be a director. And some of the doctors were physicians who had been in HIV medicine forever. Mm. But when it came to uh, the level of comfort in terms of treating patients on antiretroviral therapy, it requires the expertise that I had. Mm. So when I found myself being able, you know, to convince physicians and specialists to change regimens and courses based on the approach and the humility that I had, I was like, no, 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 girl, there's something there. There's something there. Yeah, there's something there. So by the time I decided to do public health and public policy, I knew I could do that on a bigger scale. And that's how I ended up where I am because SANAC is the highest decision-making body in terms of HIV policy in the country. We are chaired by the deputy president. And um, I I actually enjoy, you know, uh, leading the National Strategic Plan for HIV and TB in South Africa. Wow, I think that's amazing. But as part of your introduction, you mentioned the governance part of it, that you're a governance guru. And I have to tell the story. I have to tell the story. So I met, (laughs) this is where I met you. (laughs) I I met you for the first time in class. Um, and we were at the Institute of Directors and we were being schooled around governance and all these things. But Dr. T, because she had been down this road for a while, she had a lot to say. And when we had to write our exams, then she decided, ah, uh-uh, let's all have a group to study. And I have to say, I've never, I think maybe I've, I've never said this in public, but thank you for helping me pass that exam. <laughs> because then corporate governance, you are the person who made me, <laughs> you drilled it into me for me to know that King Fu and all those things. And yeah, I, yeah. It's a no. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for me. Thank you. Just so a side much. note on your leadership, because if you hadn't pulled that group together, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I was digressing, but I think I needed to say that. So so tell me, what have been your challenges though when it comes to, to leading? Because it's not always smooth sailing, I would assume. Yeah, I think uh, it, it was more being able to answer the question, um, am I comfortable with my leadership identity? Right, because I think as, as leaders, we have to be, we have to be self-aware. We have to know that we've got good parts and we've got bad parts. Some of us are horrible human beings and we treat people in despicable ways. We forget that um, we were human beings before we were leaders. You know, I, 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 lo- I love saying this. We forget that even before I was a dog, Tambume, I was just that girl from Wamash. You know, uh, and yet, you know, that as soon as I say I'm a doctor, the conversation changes because Tembi then becomes put on a pedestal. You know, before I was a manager, I was a human being. Before I was um, a a, a CEO, I was just a a human being. So um, I think um, it, 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 it really is important, as I said, to know that um, we, we've got good parts and we've got bad parts. Um, and um, it's the ability to recognize that. Um, and for my, my sins and my wanting to grow and develop further, I actually have a coach. Um, and this is where I can say um, 
you know, as much as you gave me kudos, um, I, I changed careers in the past 18 months. And one of my reasons was a conversation I had with you where I approached you as a coach. And I said to you, I had been working for a particular organization for a certain number of months, and I felt it was time for me to be a CEO. And we had a long conversation about that. Um, and it, it, it wasn't easy because it was, it was a comfort zone where I had been in for almost 16 years. I knew everything about the business. Um, and um, I actually spent seven months out of uh, employment because I left and I knew that in my next job, I would be a CEO. Mm. So uh, the, 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 the hard parts, as I said, is um, sometimes you have to trust without knowing what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. As much as you might have a clear vision, I think when people talk about VUCA, this volatility, uncertainty, uh, you know, um, complexity and ambiguity, I have led programs where donor funding is unclear. So you have to have a lot of ambiguity, tolerance. But at the same time, you've got a business to run. Mm. And you can't not make decisions. Decisions have to be made despite the ambiguity. Mm. Um, and if they are wrong, as I said, we can correct them at a later stage. So part of the difficult part of being a leader is making decisions in the face of ambiguity and uncertainty. But what I cannot stand is the immobility of indecision. Mm. So one of the hardest things I've learned is that as leaders, no matter how hard, we have to make decisions because we've got organizations to run and we've got to move forward, uh, despite how difficult things might be looking. If we make mistakes, we'll apologize later and we'll fix it. But, um, you know, business has to uh, continue. Sometimes not as usual. COVID taught us that. But... Um, business does have to continue. Yeah, yeah. I, I like what you're saying because most organizations, they get crippled yeah. by the bureaucracy of decision-making. Yeah. And at some point, everybody not having the comfort of that they can make decisions because there's this one person who has to make a decision and everything comes to a standstill. And then this one person also has to consult 20 other people and get so many so much information and and by the time the decision gets made you're thinking but that's long gone why are too we late. still talking about this too late it's too late <laughs> like the horse has bolted and we're still having this uh, this debate you know and mm -hmm. I, I think for me personally i've always appreciated leaders who are quick in making decisions because you can only deal with the information that you have at that point in time and yeah. there's a possibility that you might be wrong and you might be right, but at least the decision has been made and there's a direction that yeah. that is being taken. Yeah. So that said, what is what is one or two things that you wish you would have been told about leadership before you found yourself hmm. before preschool? I'm not sure when I started <laughs> <with preschool. laughs> before preschool. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, I think um, one of the things I would say is, um, especially when you describe, uh, you know, because obviously I was, I, I was led before I was a leader. And yeah. um, I, I consider myself a leader who's willing to be led, like the example I gave of a, 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 allowing a, an executive to drive the bus for a while, whilst, uh, you know, because I'm struggling to negotiate the terrain and, um, yeah. So I think one of the things I wish I, I had known from the start is that leadership does not mean that I always have to know everything all the time, that I always have to have all the answers to all the questions. Sometimes leadership is just about making sure that I've got the right people around me that have got uh, more there's nothing as satisfying as leading a team that's more brilliant than you are because mm -hmm. they, they, they make you shine, you know? So leadership is about making sure that you've got people that are able to compliment you. 
leadership is not about nourishing our egos. You know, I wish I, 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 I had known that leadership is about me knowing that I'm not an important person. I just have an important role to play. Mm. You know, because I, I've been, as I said, in, in instances where sometimes you, especially as a female leader, and I think you can relate to this, when, when, when you lead males, uh, it's almost as if you have to get hard in order to get through. And kindness doesn't make you any weaker. I wish, you know, I, I had known things like that because... I, I navigated that by myself. And by the time, you know, a, I, I, I discovered it, it was beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, leadership as, uh, as a kind leader that recognizes that human beings are going through a lot actually makes you stronger and allows you, as I said, to bring the best out of people because they truly appreciate the fact that you understand that they are human. So I, 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 I do wish, you know, um, um, some of those things I, I had learned at an earlier stage. Yeah, and, and I, I like that because that's my pet peeve. So my pet peeve is having women leaders that start behaving like men leaders mm. with the masculinity with, I don't even know what other adjectives to use, but when you when you're now trying to fit in into the boys' club and you lose who you are as a female, and now that for me drives me insane because I actually just want to call you out to say, Sissy, can we just stop and be okay with who we are? We don't have to now start emulating the behavior that we're seeing and and wanting to be men. It, it doesn't have to work like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that for me has always been the thing. Like, and and yeah, and, and I think figuring that out early as people get into leadership for me is, is an amazing thing. And the empathy, like the kindness and the empathy um, doesn't mean you are not a leader. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you're soft. It doesn't mean you're weak, you know? And, and I like those points. But what is the drama that comes with leadership? Let's just go there. <laughs> I think the, the, the drama that comes with leadership for me is, um, goodness, um, I'm trying to think of, of the things I can say without getting fired. Um, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the drama that comes with leadership is, um, is the ability to discern, discernment. Yeah. Because... People will always tell you what they want you to hear. Mm. So as much as you want to be a leader and have the 30,000 meter view because you are trusting your team to be doing what they need to do, you also need to be so in touch with the goings on that when information gets uh, deciphered or gets sent up to you, you are able to make informed decisions because when somebody decides to say something and it's in their interest um, you could take decisions that could result in so much drama especially when you don't get you know what 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 the story is uh, so I think the drama that comes with leadership really really comes when when people that um, you trust and lead, just tell you, you know, um, I think there's a book by U Uchimama uh, about a, a single story. Mm. Yes, you know, when, when you hear one side of a story and you decide to align yourself with that side and um, things can go belly up if you end up making decisions that are final based on that without having the substance of what's happening on, 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 on the ground. Yeah. I think the drama that also comes with leadership is, is, is I think um, I, I listened to a podcast that you did not long ago, is, 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 oh. is, is just the office politics. You know, uh, I, I loved that. I can't remember the lady you had on where she Nivens. said, um, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, she said you you if you if you regard yourself as no, I don't do politics, the politics will do you. You know what? Politics are just part of, of the drama. And um we are in the politics, we live in the politics, we need to navigate the politics. But I think the only way that um we can do that successfully is that we have to be aware. We have to be um, you know, um astute. We, we have to be um, considerate. Um, and I think we have to be informed uh, because it does not matter how technically competent you are, the politics can bring you down. Mm-hmm. So that I think is, 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 is just part of the drama that comes with it. So we, we are constantly navigating you know, the, the, the playing field such that um, your, your technical expertise is not lost um, in, 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 in the politics because as a, 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 a CEO of an organization that is supposed to drive a, a portfolio as important as HIV in this country, I've been hired for my technical competence. And what I want is for South Africans to enjoy our um, democracy without the hovering threat of HIV and TB. And I cannot be getting lost in the politics. I need to make sure that the policies support our people. And that I think is, 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 is out in several ways. The fact that the bulk of the fiscus for the HIV program in this country comes from the government. We've got the best treatment regimens in the country. We've adopted a lot of uh, prevention uh, measures. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's just the ability to navigate, um, as I said, you know, the politics versus the technical and never forgetting why you are there in the first place. Um, and uh, not, not in, a, in, a, in a prideful way, but I, I'd like to think so far, I'm, I'm navigating that quite well, uh, because if, as I said, you forget why you were brought into the job in the first place, there's potential for you to get lost in the politics in no time and you lose your value and your worth and your relevance very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, because power changes hands quickly and we forget. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's very true. That's yeah. very true. Um, and, and in your, what do you think makes a good leader? You know, there's always a debate on whether somebody is a good leader or a bad leader. And it becomes a very subjective conversation, Uh right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So what's your view on that? What makes someone a good leader? I think um, some of it I've described already. Uh, Good leaders are are leaders that are able to, for instance, um, build teams around them. And I'm talking, for instance, now around succession, et cetera. So that um, even if you get hit by a car tomorrow, the company will not die just because you are not there. So it's about growing other people, creating that enabling environment um, and making sure that, um, uh, you know, you've got successors. But at the same time, I think good leaders are leaders that don't surround themselves with yes men and yes women. Because we need, uh, you know, to, 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 be, to be challenged. We need to, uh, to be pushed to become our best in order for the organizations or the companies that we lead to become the best. Um, and, and surrounding ourselves with yes men doesn't, doesn't uh, achieve that. I think um, good leaders as well are leaders that are willing to explore the unknown. Um, and as I said, uh, fourth industrial revolution, COVID, etc. nobody would have known. Mm-hmm. The known uh, is fine, it will make us money. But at some point, as you said, um, by the time we realize that there is some value in the unknown and had we just explored it and exploited it a bit more, by the time we make the decision, it wouldn't be too late. So we need leaders who are forward thinkers and are willing to, as I said, um, you know, take into consideration strategies and uh, ideas that have never been utilized before because it cannot be business as usual, not at this day and age where we've seen how how things change. So there's a book that I read, I think by by Bill Taylor some time ago, and it's called, um, Are You Learning As Fast As The World Is Changing? 
And the truth is the world is changing and leaders have to change with that. Uh, but lastly, I think um, what makes good leaders as well is, um, is, is, is the soft skills. I think um, for me, the, the organizations that we lead are the people. The people make the organizations. And if we lead our people with empathy, with kindness, with goodness, um, with the clear vision, with the performance management, with everything else in place, but we, we, we just recognize the fact that these are other human beings, that they've got families, that they've got problems, that they've got their own struggles, um, it, it makes us such the better for it. You know, I think when we are humane and when we are human, that I think also makes us very good leaders. Yeah. Now I know why you're my friend. <laughs> just, Hesh just saying, listen, we need to continue. <laughs> so tell me what are the what are the mistakes that you've witnessed other leaders doing out there? Um, hmm. um okay. I think um I've certainly um, witnessed um, leaders that um, make emotional decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I can say it, it, it can come, for instance, from the fact that um, you are either um, the longest uh, serving CEO or you are so in love with this business or you know how things have always been done and that's how you want them to be done, you are not willing to consider anything else. There, there's nothing wrong with being emotional. Like I said, kindness is, is an emotion. Mm -hmm. But when we make emotional decisions, I think we've got the potential to make mistakes because in many instances, we do lose opportunities when the emotion makes us stuck to a certain way of doing things because mm -hmm. Anak has always done it like this. We are not willing to consider this, you know, and then we miss out on many things. When, as I said, the client has changed, the world has changed. They are asking for different things of you, uh, yet you remain stuck in a particular mindset. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the mistakes I've seen. I've also seen... Um, leaders who, who struggle with, um, with, with, with trusting, I think, the people that they lead with um, simple things like delegations of authority. And I, I posted something on my status not long ago uh, that um, there's a meeting I was invited to attend. Um, in fact, all my ex was invited to attend. Um, because I respect other people's time, I was going to be in another meeting before that. So I wrote to them and I said, um, uh, I'm going to be about 20 minutes late, uh, but please start the meeting. Um, I think uh, I trust you guys to go on without me. But when that 20 minutes was up and I was due to join the meeting, I actually looked at the subject of the meeting and the agenda. And I said, hi, Bo, why would these people need a CEO to be present? Mm -hmm. I trust them to do their job. There's nothing when I look at the agenda that makes them need me. And I actually decided not to join the meeting. So I texted one of them and I said, no, 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 carry on without me. Um, so I think there are CEOs that genuinely struggle, struggle with letting go and allowing other people to take charge. And it, it always blurs the line then, as you were saying, because people then become scared of making decisions for me because they are worried that if they make the wrong decision, the CEO is in their face all the time. Um, and if for some reason the CEO is not available for weeks or months, then decisions don't get made because people are still scared of the comeback if they make the wrong decisions. Uh, you know, so I've, I've, I've seen that in action and it can, it can be um, quite disturbing. And then I've, I've seen leaders as well who, who, who what's the word? It's, it's almost a, a, a sense of, um, you know, self-sabotage. Where, where, where you are so good at what you do that you only trust yourself to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it saddens me because that then, as I said, doesn't create the enabling environment that I was talking about. I'm, I'm a great believer in young people. And um, as much as I'm close to 50, 
I enjoy progressive discussions with young people. Um, and if, 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 if um, in my adult nature, I'm dismissive of them, uh, I probably won't take any of their ideas seriously. And, um, you know, I, I've seen leaders doing that, saying, I know more, I'm more experienced, I've been this, I've been that. And as I said, sometimes you just need five minutes with a young person to change your entire perspective on things. And I've witnessed this, for instance, you know, uh, we know that adolescent girls, young women, and now young boys, you know, are affected a lot by, by, by HIV, by mental health, substance abuse issues, um, and how they enjoy, for instance, having electronic platforms to talk to each other and mm-hmm. to support them and, uh, you know, for them to be able to connect to each other through those. And if we are left at the high table to make those decisions without their voices, we'll never get anywhere. So when they say nothing for us without us, I think they mean it. And it's not just the youth. It, ent- it extends to all key and vulnerable populations. So I've been in environments where people declare themselves as kings of castles and therefore essentially don't take other opinions. And I think that's, that's, that's a dangerous kind of leadership. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, I can, I can relate to that. It's like in corporate way, you make decisions sitting in your office and you, you leave the customer behind because you've got no idea what the customer is looking for. And you are the leader and you are making the decision and it becomes something totally different. Exactly. Yeah. But what is your view around um, abusive leaders? Because there are leaders there that really take power. Um, I'm going to say to their heads, if that's the right thing to say. And I just abusive because they can get away with it to a point, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's it's it, it's it's a it's a sad one, um, because um, you know, I mean, I think depending on where you are, also in the, in the hierarchy, um, it, it's sometimes difficult for even the, your subordinates to do anything about it, because you might be at such a level in the hierarchy that they, there isn't much that they can do. But you know, as I said, one of the things that I think makes good leaders is when good leaders know the good and the bad parts of themselves. And as I said, one of the things that I did was to get myself a coach. And in my coaching, in describing my examples, I was then able to unpack and say, you know what, Tembi, you are really bad at this and you are really good at this. Therefore, you need to improve on this. So I think certain things, um, like, for instance, with my past employer, um, coaching for senior management and executives was not um, an option. It was a must. You know, so um, I think uh, when, when you are exposed uh, to things like that, that force you to introspect in an environment which is non-judgmental, um, I think um, it, it allows you to, to grow um, a, a, as a leader. Uh, because as, as I said, really, I, I've seen horrific uh, things. Um, um, fortunately, I would say, you know, based on, on, on my open door policy, in instances where some issues were reported to me, I was able to intervene and maybe get coaching or even disciplinary measures where I, I needed to. Uh, but I, I know that there are many instances that could have been happening at a higher level and nothing could have been done about them. But I think um, it, it just has to be part of a, a culture of an organization that the leadership needs to have some kind of coaching which involves uh, you know some kind of ethics and a code of conduct and behavior uh, which includes as i said just being humane and being kind and it, it, it can't be a whether you want to attend or not it must just be part of what um, the organization wants to see if it wants to grow especially the lower level people because you know, as I said, I, I believe all the answers that I need at Sanak lie within those young people. Average age, 35, they are young. But um, some of them have been there for three to five years. They know much more than I do. And, you know, um, all they need is to be, be, to be given that platform. Yeah, wow. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that you just think people need to take away from here? 
Mm -hmm. uh, goodness. Um, I think uh, as we were talking about also um, some of the, the mistakes that we make as leaders, I think um, knowing the difference, um, you know, when we have that one mandate, the mandate is normally play to win, right? Yeah. Uh, as I speak mainly from a, a non-corporate perspective, um, but um, even in the donor environment where you are given a pot of gold first and you are expected to achieve targets, you are supposed to achieve those targets or exceed them. So you play to win. But yeah. we have a lot of leaders who then get stuck in their ways and don't just play to win, but they play not to lose. Mm -hmm. And that I think um, is something that I think we need to introspect about as leaders. Um, are we still relevant, as you were saying? Are we still responsive to the needs of the clients because the needs of our clients um, do change? Um, and when we keep getting stuck, as I said, on what the world knows or what is known, we then become reluctant to explore the unknown. And I think and the unknown becomes quite risky. And 10 years down the line, when people are discussing the fourth industrial revolution, you know, or uh, whatever they want to call it, um, somebody young who was young then could say, no, but I told you that this was coming. Uh, you know, so I, I, I think it's, um, we, we need to really recognize the difference between constantly playing to win, which means being willing to change your game plan and your strategy. And I'm not saying we are going to have clear visions, but be schizophrenic and change the plan every month. No, yeah. but I'm saying that there will come a time when you have to have, um, I nearly use the, the, the male uh, figure, um, but you, well, you have to have the, the guts to make those yeah. difficult decisions the ones that will make you unpopular in order for the organization to reach the next level. And you won't always be liked for it. And it's okay. Wow, thank you. On that note, I need to ask, what was the last song you were playing in your car? Ah! Ah! <laughs> let, me find my, let, me, let me find my phone for you. Uh, let me see. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a song that um, one of my cousins listens to. I hope you can hear this. Ah, my friend, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for really taking the time. I know it's been a while since we've been wanting to do this. And I highly appreciate you. are a very busy woman. I really appreciate that you really made the time and you were here. So for anybody who was watching us or listening to us, um, yeah, I've got friends that are doing amazing things and they are crazy at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and they're human beings. And yeah, please let us know what you think of our change conversations and really hope that you take something out of this. Tim, thank you very much. Highly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kome. It's a pleasure.